Hello, hello everybody and welcome. Uh, I am Pedro Arduino. I am a member of the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicines Committee on Geological and Geotechnical Engineering, known as COGI. COGI hosted a webinar on September 5th uh, of this year in which Dr. Allen Marr gave an informative presentation on geotechnical aspects of tailing dams and their failures after which we spend a few minutes responding to questions from our audience. Allen had a time to respond only to a few of them uh, that we received, so he has generously agreed to spend uh, an additional amount of time uh, with us responding to some of these other questions that were presented. So just to introduce Allen again, uh, a, a quick uh, bio of him, uh, Dr. Allen uh, founded and leads uh, Geocom, one of the foremost providers in the United States of America of real-time web-based performance monitoring of civil engineering structures, including dams, deep excavations and tunnels, among others. He also has extensive experience in testing to measure the mechanical properties of earthen materials, designing earth structures, determining the causes of poor performance of geotechnical structures, developing cost-effective remedial measures for travel projects and risk management. Dr. Mark has an ex extensive experience evaluating the stability of tailing dams, the topic that he of her, his presentation, and other waste retention facilities and monitoring their performance. He's an elected member of the US National Academy of Engineering and of the MOLES. Please keep in mind here that any conclusions or recommendations provided by Dr. Marr are his own and should not be thought of recommendations from the National Academies or Cogi. So with that intro, uh, thank you, Alan, for being with us. Uh, I want just to mention that we have like 85 questions. <laughs> uh, we responded very few during the webinar, and maybe we can address some of those right now. Okay. So. Uh, I will try to do this in, as informal as possible and trying to be as um, accurate to the, what the question was. Uh, so I will try to read them as they were presented. So the first one of the questions that we had or the first one was, uh, you seem to be talking about liquefaction as a phenomenon that occurs after failure of the dam rather than as the cause of failure. Could you please say a little bit more about this? Yes, I um, think that this is uh, somewhat misunderstood in, in the industry. Um, you know, it, my view is that almost all known liquefaction failures or that described as liquefaction failures are ex actually the result of stability failures of the dam that then uh, where the liquefaction then follows. Uh, if we have a dam, a barrier that's containing the tailings designed properly with the proper factor of safety for undrained and drained failures, uh, then uh, it's the failure of that containment. If it stays in place, liquefaction really cannot occur in static situations. Um, so generally liquefaction follows the loss of stability. Seismic cases might be a little different where the shaking can actually liquefy the tailings that can increase the pressures on a barrier that it has marginal stability and as a result create a failure. But the seismic is a separate special case. Okay. Um, here I have a kind of a long one to, to read a little bit, but I think it's, it's a good one. And it reads, um, world mine tailing failures estimates that there are at least 18,000 unclosed tailing dams in the world, most of which are of the upstream construction type, which is generally acknowledged to be unsuitable for storage of materials susceptible to static liquefaction. We see in the failure record and now in the Church of England disclosures that upstream dispositions are continuing for type of materials known to be subject to static liquefaction. A uh, big long ago said uh, uh, that upstream dams shouldn't be used for any materials that are less than 60% sand, and the granulometry curves of the failed dams clearly show that he got that right. We have all the science, though not the technical expertise in sufficient numbers. How can we go about identifying and prioritizing 
that the de-risking of presently at risk dams, I estimate that at least 3,000 worldwide require this in-depth analysis uh, urgently. Can you comment on that? Yes, um, yeah, I think there are kind of two points out of that question um, that are relevant. Uh, one is, is a, I think I heard a, a statement that in general upstream dams uh, or tailings dams constructed by upstream methods uh, are not advised. I think there's not consensus on that. Um, you know, there are a belief amongst people who, who understand how to design these properly that a properly designed upstream tailings dam can be just satisfactorily safe and perform quite well. Uh, so we need to educate people about how to do these properly and uh, make sure they get built properly. Uh, and in my view, there's no reason why the upstream method has to be abandoned. But there are many out there, uh, as the question implies, upstream methodologies used that are not safe or, or mar have marginal stability. How do we sort through all of those? That's a big challenge. And um, to me, it's, um, it would be great if we could add to Steve Vick's uh, screening recommendation where based on gradation, uh, we can determine whether the material might liquefy or not. If we could add a couple more screening methodologies to that so we can help narrow the number of uh, risky facilities, that would be great. There needs to be some work done on that. Um, I think I'm reminded in this of uh, what the Corps of Engineers did here in the United States in the uh, 70s when we had a recognized dam safety problem with uh, water retention dams where they underwent what was called a phase one assessment where people did some screen, had some screening uh, guidelines and tried to rank dams mostly by risk. And from that then went to a phase two investigations for those that were more risky. I think it would be good if we could identify something along those lines that get applied to these uh, tailing dams, particularly those built by upstream method. Okay. Uh, let's go a little bit now on some questions on monitoring. Um, so are there available inspection or monitoring methods that could uh, have been used at the, for example, Mount Poly or even the recent facilities in Brazil that could have been identified, uh, that could have identified the problems that led to the failure? What are the emerging techniques that could be implemented uh, for future cases? Um, yeah, this is, this is a very good and interesting question and interesting area. I think the first of all, you know, we have to be really careful in designing monitoring programs that we're really looking at specific uh, failure modes for a dam. Uh, where are our uncertainties and what instruments can we use to, that will give meaningful measurements? Uh, there's a tendency to just throw out a bunch of uh, different types of monitoring devices common across all dams uh, and then hope for the best. I really urge people to spend some time and effort designing your monitoring program to get after the information you need. In the case of Mount Poly, I was not involved in that, but I have reviewed the excellent uh, report that was done afterward by the experts that looked at it. And that was a failure through a, a soft clay seam in the foundation. I believe the instrumentation would have given an earlier indication of movements, unexpected movements in that foundation something like a slope inconometer, for example, which is a vertical pipe put down in the ground, and then you take readings of tilt of that pipe, integrate those to tell you how lateral movement is occurring with time. I believe that that weak clay seam would have developed shear strains in advance of the failure and would have given warning. Uh, there are also, um, when we're looking at the stability of the barrier, it's of the barrier dam itself, a key part of all that is pore pressure. And so trying to put in pore pressure monitoring devices called piezometers at enough points that we get meaningful data to tell us what are the real pore pressures on the critical failure surface is a very useful tool. Um, in the case of Brumadinho, um, this is a unique, or is a, is a case where with upstream method of construction containing very loose tailings that tend to fail in a brittle mode it is really hard to get advanced notice out of the instrumentation of movements because the movements prior to failure are very small. And uh, generally those failures are involved 
a, a buildup of pore pressure. I don't know if that's the case in Brumadinho, but generally these kinds of failures are builds up in pore pressure, which is like an unloading and deformations and strains that occur there are quite small. Mm -hmm. It's very hard in many of these cases to expect that deformation monitoring of the tailings themselves is going to give you an adequate warning. Mm -hmm. But piezometers telling you what the pore pressures are can really help inform what the actual factor of safety is. And if that drops well below 1.5, then that's a good warning to me. Uh, this is good. Actually, you uh, have already answered a few of the other questions that were here. But there is one that struck me. Suppose that you have now a limited budget. <laughs> uh, is it better to spend more uh, in ground investigation to capture weak layers in the foundation or geotechnical monitoring, vibrating cores, piezometers, and phenomena? Oh, that's a tough question, isn't it? You know, the, the trade-off we always have to wrestle with, um, you know, I personally favor knowing what is at the site, knowing what the conditions are, making sure I understand what is there that may drive stability. To me, if I don't have that, um, even if I go and put in instrumentation, it may be difficult to understand or interpret what the instrumentation is telling me. To, to best use instrumentation, I've got to have a good mental model of what that site is and how it may perform. So I, I, I guess I, I'm a, I would prefer uh, defining the site conditions and the parameters first, um, and then still trying to get a little money um, uh, for monitoring. But I also say, uh, don't get beat down by limited money. We have on these projects a potential on some of them for very significant risks. We need to inform our clients of the owners of what those risks are and what the value of exploration and monitoring is so our clients can better understand their risks and can assign appropriate amounts of money to help uh, gather information to manage those risks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so and, and a follow up question here is who should be doing the monitoring? Uh, who is the authority uh, in the U.S. and maybe you can comment in other parts of the world that you may have seen? Who is in charge of doing this? Well, it's rarely authorities. I don't think that's the proper role of authorities, uh, so we can cross that one off. Mm -hmm. um, it's ultimately, it's the owner who's paying the money uh, to do this, and so they have a vested interest. But many owners don't really have the technical skills and capabilities to carry out effective monitoring programs. Some do, but many, most don't. Um, and so it gets to a, a someone specialized in the monitoring area uh, who knows um, what types of instruments are appropriate, what measurements are, um, are significant or meaningful to us. And then how to, more importantly too, is how to interpret the data that come out of these pro, uh, monitoring programs. I see a lot of failures in that last step. People get the data and they don't know what to do with it. So I think the answer, your short answer to your question, Pedro, is, is somebody who has the knowledge and capability to do it and know what to do with the data. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the, uh, now I have a question here that it was more on the regulations. And do you believe that the federal guidelines for dam safety are uh, the ones that should be applied for tailing dams? And if not, what is the most significant factor that should be addressed first? Well, just speaking as an engineer uh, uh, who understands uh, how these things behave and work, the federal guidelines that have been put together recently uh, under the joint uh, efforts of FERC and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation are commendable, I think, and if followed, produce dams that are safe. Um, I'm of the personal belief that the technologies we use to design and construct and operate dams to store water are entirely relevant to dams storing tailings or any other material that the release of which could cause harm. So um, I think we have to wait for the industry and the regulators to try to figure out you know, how they might best move towards something like uh, those federal standards. Uh, they, they basically are, have been around and served us well for a long time 
in in the water dam business. So to me, they're if you have if you need to go someplace, go to those, and they'll give you a good background basis for designing a safe dam. Yeah, and from that perspective, uh, from a regulatory perspective, what do they or the regulators or we sh what should we be asking for to ensure we are getting correct information to assess barrier safety for mining companies? Yeah, that's that's a good question too, Pedro. In that, um, unfortunately, a lot of regulators, you know, they're thinly staffed. They mm -hmm. might not have the technical expertise. Uh, to get into what is really some pretty interesting and complicated soil mechanics in dealing with uh, tailings. Um, and, and so it's, it's, a, it's quite a challenge. Um, you know, as I think the, the, the bet we, we could hope for on average a regulator to be able to read a report from a mine owner uh, prepared by a, a qualified geotechnical engineer and get a sense that whoever did this work knew what they were doing and that the results are reliable, believable, and can be, uh, be used. Um, some regulators are capable of, of actually um, performing stability analyses, for example, but, but that's rare. Um, I think we, we really have to rely on getting competent expertise in specialized consulting firms to address uh, these failure modes in dams and make sure that they're all uh, dealt with properly and and, uh, and and that dam safety is kept uh, in control. So, so you mentioned it's a complex soil behavior problem that we are facing here. So we have a couple of questions related with that, soil behavior, soil testing, and a lot of them are related to um, uh, what tests can be used to estimate contracted behavior. Can we use a lab test uh, or CPT or other in situ test? But one that attracted all my attention is how do you, even if you have that, how do you determine whether a material is contractive or dilated in a highly variable material? What kind of lab or in situ testing uh, do you recommend? Yeah, this is a real challenge. You know, I. I think in the presentation I made the point that um, it's very important for us to be able to uh, um, examine the different uh, soils involved, potentially involved in stability and separate them into dilative behavior. That means they want to expand when we try to shear them uh, or contractive behavior, which means they want to decrease in volume when we try to shear them. And under certain circumstances, that volume decrease causes liquefaction. And I said, conceptually, we understand those, those points as, as specialists in soil mechanics. Uh, but to actually try to do tests that very, very reliably discriminate between those two behaviors is hard. Uh, our tools uh, have a lot of uncertainty in them. And, uh, and, and so while conceptually, we know what needs to be done to actually achieve it on a, on a tailings dam can be quite difficult. So with that as a preface, uh, techniques involve field tests, particularly comb penetration testing. And there are some semi-empirical methodologies that have been developed um, that you can take your, your penetration test resistance, throw it in a spreadsheet and get a curve that nicely divides the measurements into uh, layers or soils that show contracted behavior from those that show dilated behavior. And, you know, that looks, that's very nice. It's very appealing. It's very straightforward. And almost any engineer could do this, simply taking the data file from CPT testing. But I caution people that that divider line is really not well defined. And it could move around uh, based on material type. So we, have, we, we, we know what to do there, but we, it's just not as precise a delineation as we'd like to have. We, we wind up with a lot of uncertainty. The specific question is how to deal with the variability. You know, the cone penetration test is one of the best we have to reveal that variability uh, because it can give us a measurement every couple of centimeters. But we're still going to be left with engineers to, as you know, having to make some, some call at some point as to where is that dividing line between contractive and dilative. And we can do that with the help of lab testing. Um, some people believe we can't do lab testing because we have a hard time getting samples of tailings that are not undisturbed, that are, um, 
but with good techniques, you can improve the uh, success rate there. A lot of drilling is not done properly, uh, and therefore you're destined to not get good samples. That can be overcome, or you can try to get disturbed samples and reconstitute them in the laboratory to field conditions and then run tests on that. The laboratory testing, we have control over stress and drainage, so we tend to be able to better define the difference between contractive and dilated behavior. In my practice, we really do all these things. We do field testing, we do lab testing. It's all trying to help us get ourselves um, confident that what we have to have for density or void ratio in the field to give us dilated behavior is, is something we, we know and feel comfortable with. There's no simple answer here. So there, is a, there was a question that related to that because we talk about, we have the tailing dams and then of course uh, they are there. We look at the, um, uh, get samples, we do in situ tests, we go to the lab. Uh, but the question was, what do you recommend for determining tailings properties before the tailings are being produced? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, um, you go within a given tailings deposit that's been around for, for many years and stuff varies all over the place within that, that singular deposit. Why? Well, the source of the ores change over time. The milling processes change radically over time. The way the materials get de uh, deposited within the um, retention area can change quite a bit. So you just got a hodgepodge of materials that may vary all the way from coarse grain to very fine grain, both horizontally and vertically. Um, so what are you gonna do beforehand when you have no clue as to what that process, what the ore in that process is gonna produce for tailings? You gotta look for you know, some operations someplace, maybe in the nearby area that has similar ore deposits and similar processing facilities of what you're using here. Take data from that situation We've even gone on to other companies' sites and taken samples and tested them to be able to try to characterize what our new site might, um, might have for properties. And then in that case, introduce a, a healthy dose of, of um, conservatism, really, and selecting design parameters for the beginning of the operation. Build in a design that might have some flexibility so that as you start producing tailings, you can adapt the construction methods or maybe the design itself to what you're actually producing. But I think a key part of this question too is how do you track and monitor the, the characteristics of the tailings over time so that you are ensuring yourself that what you're getting is consistent with what you used in the design. And we fail in the industries a lot to do that. We just, you know, we start out with a design and we, we start doing things and the, milling processes change and we don't recognize, or the placement processes change, we don't recognize how those things might be impacting the safety of the dam. And so somebody was asking here, when the, the tailing materials, the mechanical response of the tailing materials is very similar, very similar to that, those of sands. So with what we know about sands is, can we infer more or less, or they are different? So um, I think, first of all, I should make a distinction here between um, cohesive, non-cohesive uh, tailings. That's very important. And most of my remarks here have been focused on non-cohesive, non-plastic tailings, because those are the ones that are really uh, subject to uh, potential liquefaction. And so if, if we continue along those lines of uh, non-cohesive, uh, non-plastic uh, tailings, which is the majority of ores, um, then, um, and, and the, uh, we have to recognize that in some cases, some of these materials may develop some cementation. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and um, so leaving that out as well. So now we're, we're down to a non-cohesive material that is primarily frictional in, in its sources then they behave very similarly to the loose sands. And a lot of the studies of liquefaction behavior of materials uh, it, are done with, with sands because they're easier to work with and don't have some of the environmental con uh, con or contamination concerns. It's easier for students to work with sands and tailings mm -hmm. and do this research. 
Good. So let, let's transition now to some other questions that are not just to related to soy behavior, more with design and, and dam performance. Um, um, so I would like, the question was, I would like to know if tailing dams can fail in the short term during or immediately after construction or not. If they do, what are the stability requirements for the short term? Yeah, you know, good question. Of course, tailing stamps can fail during construction. Many of the failures that have occurred have occurred while material was still being added. Um, one of the examples I gave in the presentation was at Tyrone down in the southwest United States, which was a copper tailing stamp. They were very actively um, operating the facility and they started adding tailings at a much faster rate um, faster than how the tailings could respond to that added load, and that drove the failure. So, uh, you know, we, we absolutely have to be very concerned with stability uh, during the so-called construction, which in tailing stands usually is a, you know, we're, we're constructing and we're filling at the same time. Uh, and that's different than a water retention dam where we typically construct it, complete it, and then fill it. Um, the, the general, ideally, during, uh, uh, stability during this phase ought to be, in my mind, the same as once it's completed, um, stability requirements. And so I'm generally pushing for a factor of safety of 1.5 myself. There are some guidelines that come out of the dams for water retention that says you can use a factor of safety of 1.3 during initial construction. But that's keeping in mind that the consequence of failure during the construction of a water retention dam is quite small, really, to offsite facilities because there's no water in the dam. If we get a stability failure, it's, it's confined to the project itself. In the case of a tailings dam, you know, we're constructing the dam. It's, it, it, you know, it may be part, partly towards its final design height and we're putting water and tailings behind it. And so to me, this is more like what we use in earth dam design, uh, where the required minimum factor of safety is 1.5. But there are some regulatory agencies which will permit and allow a factor of safety of 1.3 during this uh, construction phase. There is a question here on, on, uh, on seepage, and uh, it's, it reads, based on your experience, which seepage control method would you recommend or have worked uh, or have worked well before, if you can comment on those? Yes, this is, uh, you know, any, as we design water retention dams, um, you know, a good dam designer knows that a key part of the design is to control how water flows through that dam. And so one of the primary elements we use uh, for that uh, is a drain to capture water that gets through the dam and safely remove it from the dam uh, so that we don't get uh, pore pressure buildup in the downstream half of the dam and we don't get um, seepage induced fine migration or so-called piping or internal erosion. So the common methods there would be drainage uh, blankets across the bottom of the dam between the at, on top of the foundation reaching well back in from the toe and then perhaps having to supplement that with inclined or vertical drainage blankets to capture water that's coming through the dam at higher elevations uh, these are to me are really important elements that many upstream many tailing stamps don't really have adequate provisions for Hopefully we're recognizing that in the industry and future dams will make better use of these drainage control features. So uh, here there is a question where I will add my grain of salt uh, here because the question was very short and it was mentioned several times. And the question is, uh, it mentioned Dr. Morgenstern was referring to an industry-wide shortage of adequate skill levels in a stability analysis in design. Are we missing something in our courses? <laughs> are we not teaching something? Uh, are, are, maybe we are not concentrated on some things and not in some important topics. Would you recommend us to do something different? <laughs> 
I, I think this is a challenge for our geotechnical discipline. Um, and that I, I uh, this is my impression. You know, when, when I go to hire a new engineer just graduated out of the university and I start asking them these specific case situations, how do you select strength for this case? Many of them are really puzzled and befuddled. They're full of knowledge and information on all kinds of things. They can talk about probabilistic methods, but the basic fundamental stuff mm -hmm. don't have a detailed working knowledge of. Mm -hmm. you know, the basic assumptions and limitations in stability analysis, many of them don't just really have it, have it deep enough in them that they recognize how, to, how that's meaningful in practice. That's something that comes with experience and with experience under mentoring and uh, guidance of, uh, for, uh, of uh, older or more, uh, more experienced engineers. I think we have to be careful. You know, a young engineer can pick up a stability program and, and get, you know, make it really zing and zing uh, in a matter of a, of a few hours, but they don't have any concept of how to get pore pressures to put into that program or how to take measured pore pressures and and adequately describe those in, in, within that stability program or how to choose uh, the appropriate um, strength parameters. For example, I see a lot of people taking triaxial strength test results, undrained strength test results and using them in undrained stability analyses. That may not be the right strength. I would prefer to use direct simple shear tests, which is about two thirds of what you get out of a triaxial test. These are some important details that the specialists in the field understand, but the typical student coming out of the university doesn't really have a full grasp of. Yeah, so maybe doing more internships or calls before or during a master program for bringing more industry into our program would be a good uh, solution. This is something that I, I, was, I was trying to add. <laughs> Um, in the uh, so we are running a little bit out of uh, time, but I, let me ask you a couple of more questions here. And one uh, that it, it appeared to me interesting is one that says, uh, "Are dry stack tailings downs a substantial improvement? What are the problems of those?" Yes, um, just so everyone understands, what most tailings dams historically have been uh, uh, filled by hydraulic means. Uh, uh, where we just mix the tailings with a lot of water. They may have like 15% solids content. You dump those out into the reservoir and let them settle out. That leaves a very loose structure. So uh, over the last few years, uh, people have tr been trying to overcome this by uh, somehow consolidating the tailings, compressing them, reducing their water content, increasing their solids content to something that's more truly like a solid. It's more compact, it's more dense, and ideally it would not uh, liquefy. And then you haul those, instead of hydro hydraulically placing them by pipeline, you haul them by truck or other piece of equipment and you put them into an area like a landfill. That's called dry stacking. And that's definitely an improvement uh, in that we're getting a material that's not in a, a very loose state. It's going to be more like medium to dense, depending on how it gets placed. And so there's an inherent, it costs a lot more, and there's an inherent belief that if we do this, we're not gonna have any problems. But I would like to caution that, um, that um, you know, it's still, they're not dry. They're called dry stacking, but the tailings aren't dry. They still have water in them. And so if that process hasn't been controlled carefully, um, you can wind up with layers or zones within the dry stack that are higher water content. They're gonna have lower strength you will get changes in the degree of saturation as you add more material on top and cause these, um, these early place materials to be compressed, which means their degree of saturation is gonna go up. Or there's a tendency to, and if you're in an area with rainfall where you might get rain on a layer overnight and then it gets covered, and now you're left with a high water content loose material in the dry stack that becomes a potential plane of weakness. So, Dry stacking overall, yes, is the potential for us to significantly improve and, or certainly avoid the, the uh, or reduce the potential for liquefaction failures, but they're not a, uh, a total cure-all for our problems in uh, geotechnical stability. 
not the holy grail exactly yeah, yeah unfortunately not and and we're still i mean the industry's working hard to find ways of doing this uh that are uh not uh, for for optimal costs so one last question one last question here and then i will let you go so uh, and with the ongoing changes in climate are other considerations and design parameters needed to make them safer? What do you think about this? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, all of us are kind of trying to wonder what all this, uh, you know, what are the real engineering impacts of uh, climate change? You know, we, we design things that, you know, some of them are to last in perpetuity. Um, so what, how do you do that? Um, and, and so I, I don't think it introduces anything conceptually different than what we already do. It just adds some challenges to what we already do. Um, I think climate change in terms of dam safety and dam stability, you know, are things like higher inflows into dams so that the like the potential for failure by overtopping uh, mm -hmm. goes up. Uh, that, you know, we haven't designed enough reservoir capacity in the dam to handle the inflows that come from these increasingly large storms. So increasing probability of overtopping. That also brings with it the potential for increasing pore pressures within the stored tailings in the dam uh, because you're putting more water on top. So pore pressures within the dam are going to increase and that's going to decrease stability. So we've got to make sure that we're taking that into account. Um, and... Um, and then uh, we're potentially creating more wet conditions during constru construction that make uh, compaction difficult and then leave weak or loose zones uh, that can, uh, can later on contract and lose strength. So that, you know, if climate change means more, more wet days, a lot more rain, a lot more difficult construction conditions, then that's probably challenging our ability to get things done right and we're going to be left with some defects that show up later. Okay, so we better take a look at that. So uh, I think that we have reached uh, more than 30 minutes and uh, we, that's what we allocated for this. So I think that uh, we will stop around here. I just want to thank Alan for the first the presentation that he gave on September 5th and for the time he took today to respond uh, to more of the technical community's questions. It's so, my pleasure. Yeah. Any final word that you want to say? No, just uh, let's, uh, let's all renew our efforts to do good engineering on these and try to improve overall safety for the good of our communities and the environment. Excellent. So just want to mention that to the audience that if you if they if you have questions about Kogi or ideas for topics you would like to seek over in future webinars, please reach out to Samantha Maxino with the email that I think is provided in maybe in this uh, screen. So with that, uh, thank you again, uh, Alan, very much, and goodbye to all. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you, Alan.